Hello, I'm Ralph Gable of the Electronics for the Inquisitive Experimenter YouTube channel. I released a video on how to make your own 4 to 1 ballon using coax a few weeks ago. The one I created for the video was centered on the 2 meter band or 146 megahertz. I was asked, well, why would you even need a 4 to 1 ballon for the 2 meter band? And that is a good question. It was then and there that I decided I needed to create this follow-up video to answer this very question. In this video, I'm going to create a folded dipole antenna for the 2 meter band and use the same 4 to 1 ballon I created in my previous video as the impedance matching device. If you haven't seen the video on the 4 to 1 ballon yet, I've put a link to this video up in the corner for you for your convenience. Now, an alternate way of matching this antenna to your 50 ohm feed line would be to create a stub match, as I show how to do in my video demo number two for Smith charts, where I actually create a stub match for a folded dipole antenna for two meters. I've put a link to this video up in the corner for you in case you're interested in that. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to add a comment to this video. If you find this video helpful, please click on the like and don't forget to subscribe. Okay, let's start by making a plan. Anytime I begin any antenna project, my first stop is my 4NEC2 antenna modeling program. Well, what is 4NEC2? It is a free, yes I did say, free antenna modeling program. I've provided a link to where you can get your own copy to use down in the description. Now, if you're not familiar with it and need a quick leg up on how to use it, I will direct you to my video series on the subject. Take a look up in the corner to find a link to the first video in that series. Now, I'm not going to spend the time here stepping through how to model this antenna. I will step you through the model that I have created. I have provided a link to the model file down in the description. If you want, you can pause here, quickly download it, and follow along in your own 4NEC2 program. Now, let's look at this model. When we open the model file, the first place we have to go is to set the characteristic impedance. A folded dipole has the characteristic impedance of 300 ohms. In the main window, we click on the settings menu item and select the characteristic impedance option from the drop down menu. Enter 300 into the data field of the pop up window and then click on OK. So that we're looking at the same thing, let's set the editor to the new NEC editor. Again, in the main window, click on the settings menu item and then select the NEC editor new option in the drop-down menu. Now we open the model. Click on the editor icon. The model will open in the geometry tab. One last thing before we get into what makes this model tick, click on the frequency slash ground tab. The frequency should be set to 146 megahertz. Environment to the real ground and main ground set to whatever is appropriate for your area. In my case, moderate is a reasonable choice. Now we can click on the Symbols tab and walk through the definitions that make this model work. All of the dimensions that I will be talking about here are in feet, which leads to some pretty funky looking numbers. At the very top is height, which is the antenna's height above ground. This is the height of the midpoint of the antenna. The antenna is vertically oriented along the z-axis. Then we have the inside underscore dist, which is the horizontal distance between the antenna conductors on the inside of the antenna. It is also the diameter of the end disks in the bending jig. End to end is the vertical distance between the inside of the ends of the antenna. It is also the distance between the two end disks in the bending jig, which you will see in a little while. 
wire underscore rad is the radius of the wire or tubing used in the construction of the antenna. Finally, we have num underscore side underscore segs, which, as the name implies, is the number of segments in the two sides of the antenna. I selected this number so that the length of the segments in the sides is as close to the length of the segments in the ends, and it must be odd. This value affects the position of the feed point on the source load tab. The rest of the stuff are calculated values for lengths and coordinates. I would have loved to include the 4 to 1 ballon in this simulation, except I have yet to figure out how to model one of them. With the overall inside length of 37 and 1 quarter inches, or 94.6 centimeters, the inside distance of 2 inches, or 5.1 centimeters, this was just, well, a feel-good number, and using some number 4 solid copper wire, which is 0.2 inches, or 5.1 millimeters in diameter, let's see how our antenna should perform. So I close the editor. I click on the calculator icon to calculate new data. Select frequency sweep, set the sweep to start at 144 megahertz, stop at 148 megahertz with a step of 0.05 megahertz. Now we click on generate. And there we go. With a characteristic impedance of 300 ohms, we have an SWR that is 1.11 or better across the entire 2 meter band, with its center right at 146 megahertz. Of course, we're going to be attaching a 4 to 1 ballon made from 50 ohm coax and measuring the results in a 50 ohm system so we're not going to see the same kind of results. But nonetheless, it gives us some confidence in some reasonably good results. Now, let's go to the bench and see my bending jig. So, here's the beast. I had a scrap piece of framing lumber that I pressed into service for this one. I used a hole saw to create my 2-inch or 5.1 centimeter round end discs. These two discs are spaced so that the ends are the desired 37 and 1 quarter inch or 94.6 centimeters. I assume the feed point of the antenna would have the wires 1 half inch or 12.7 millimeters apart, so I made the marks on the base so I would know where the ends of the wires should end up. My wire, if you want to call it that, is number 4 solid copper electrical ground wire. It's not the easiest stuff in the world to work with. Now, let's build our folded dipole. First, I had to figure out how long my wire had to be. So there is the requisite math. Working with the real numbers, it is 37 and a quarter inches tip to tip inside. Remembering that the wire itself is 0.2 inches in diameter. It is two inches side to side inside, remembering again that the diameter of the wire is 0.2 inches. The straight sides will be the overall tip to tip inside length minus the side to side inside distance, which gives us a length of 35 and one quarter inches or 89.53 centimeters. I'm going to need two of these. Well, what about the ends? I mean, those are those rounded things. How do we calculate that distance? Well, we will essentially be making a complete circle out of the wire. We're coming from the feed point, around the top, and then around the bottom. And so we have one half of the circle up here, and we have one half of the circle down here, making for a full circle. So the length of the wire that we need to do this is the circumference of that full circle, which is found by pi times the diameter. Now, our diameter is the inside horizontal distance of the antenna 
plus the diameter of the wire. That's because we have half of the diameter of the wire on one side of that horizontal distance and half on the other side of the horizontal distance. So it is 2 inches for the inside plus 0.2 inches for the diameter of the wire, which gives us 2.2 inches or 5.59 centimeters. Now, the length associated with our ends will be 2.2, that's that diameter, times pi, which gives us a total length of 6.91 inches or 17.6 centimeters. Now, we're only going to need one of these because, like I said, that's the full circumference of the circle, and we're using half for the top and half for the bottom. So, we add it all together. We get 2 times 35 and a quarter, which are the sides, plus 6.91, which is the two ends, which gives us 77.41 inches or 196.6 centimeters. Now, knowing that reality is often a bit different than theory, I'm going to cut my wire a bit long, say 78 inches or 198.1 centimeters. I laid my tape out on the floor and I taped it in place so I didn't have to chase it around the floor. Then I taped one end of the wire to the floor with some of my Gorilla duct tape and then I rolled out enough wire to make my 78 inches. I straightened the wire a little bit as is reasonable and then I cut it to length right at 78 inches. Finally, I do a little more straightening so I don't quite have to fight it as much when I get it on the jig. Now, we are ready to bend it into an antenna using our bending jig. I start this process by positioning the end of the wire at the end point mark, securing it in place using some cable staples as you see here. The wire is routed up against the side of the end disc and secured against that disc using a small nail. Next, we bend the wire around the end disc and secure on the other side again with a small nail. I also use some cable staples to help route it along the line. Straightening the wire a bit as I went, I brought the wire up against the side of the end disc at the other end of the jig. I secured this in place again using a small nail as before. Using the disc as a guide, I bent the wire around the disc, securing it at the end of the bend with a cable staple. Again, straightening the wire as I went, I routed the wire to the antenna feed point, securing it with cable staples as needed. As planned, the end extended past the mark for the second feed point. I trimmed off the excess material using my Dremel tool and a cutoff tool, and now we have to prepare it for use. The very next step is to tin the ends of the wire. There's a lot of thermal mass here, so a soldering gun or high wattage soldering iron is required. I applied solder paste and then tinned the ends using my solder gun. Now, the antenna is still all wibbly wobbly, so I had to find a way to secure it in place for testing. While my quick solution could be modified to accommodate field deployment, what you will see here is not intended for field deployment. It is for testing purposes only. What I did was take a piece of PVC pipe and I drilled a couple of holes through and through spaced at 2.2 inches or 5.6 centimeters and then I carefully cut the PVC pipe right through at the center of these holes to make two semicircular arcs at the ends of the pipe. The antenna material sits in these divots and is held in place using zip ties. This secures the feed point ends at one half inch or 12.7 millimeters from each other and maintains the distance between the opposing sides of the antenna. Finally, I solder the ends of the 4 to 1 ballon pigtails to the feed point. Now we're ready for testing. While not ideal by any stretch of the imagination, I chose to dangle my antenna from the floor joist above my bench. And what were the test results? Now, B 
before we get too excited, because usually when we're messing with antennas, we have in our mind, we want one-to-one -one SWR. We have to remember that this is a folded dipole, which has a nominal characteristic impedance of 300 ohms with a four-to-one ballon, which gives us a nominal impedance to the connector of 75 ohms, which comes out to be a 1.5 to 1 SWR. If you were to choose to use a step match for impedance matching, this could be brought very close to a 1 to 1. Well, what are we seeing here with our 4 to 1 ballon? An SWR at or below 1.5 to 1 across the entire 2 meter band. And all by itself, this is pretty good. We'll also see that the SWR is much lower at the top end of the band, approaching 1.1 to 1. This means to us that the antenna in this less than ideal environment is short. Now being that antenna length is a simple proportion related to the resonant frequency, we could simply make our next version, you know, 37 and 3 quarters inches or 95.9 centimeters long instead and we might move it down to our desired frequency of 146 megahertz. Even without moving it or reinventing it, the SWR is quite acceptable for the 2 meter band. Now I'm going to attempt to recreate this same antenna using one quarter inch or 6.35 millimeter copper tubing. While the wire version is quite sturdy, it's also quite heavy for its size. What if I created the exact same antenna using copper tubing instead of heavy wire? My construction technique would be different, and I've never bent tubing this way without kinking it. I bought 10 feet or 3 meters of quarter inch or 6.35 millimeter copper tubing and a cutesy little tubing bending tool thingy, what's it call it. Now I have to cut my material to length. So how long do I cut my tubing? Well, the side dimensions remain the same. That's still going to be 35 and 1 quarter inches or 89.53 centimeters. What does change is the lengths necessary to run around the two ends. The new diameter is two and one quarter inches or 5.72 centimeters. And with this, we can quickly calculate the ends to be 7.07 inches or 19.95 centimeters, which gives us a total length of two times 35 and a quarter plus 7.07 a total of 77.57 inches or 197 centimeters. But like before, I'm going to cut it long, so I'm going to cut it to say 78 and a half inches. Now we get to form it into an antenna. As I thought about how I was going to build this thing, I noodled on this a lot. I cannot simply bend the tubing around the end discs like I did the wire. If I did this, it would surely kink and just be ugly. I had to use a tool. So here's my clever ploy. I located the center of the cut length of tubing and I made a mark. Then I measured from that mark out to the place where the tubing would have to begin its trip back around toward the feed point. Now, let me give you a tip. Before I started using my inexpensive tubing bending tool, I had to lubricate this portion right here, the place, the part that actually moved in the process of bending, so that it would glide effortlessly over the surface of the tubing. Otherwise, I found myself fighting this thing to get it to bend the tubing the way I wanted to. So using my tool, I bent the tubing a full 180 degrees so that the end would be heading back to the feed point. And then I repeated this for the other end right from my marks that I made on there. I laid it on my jig 
And to my surprise, it fit on my jig just the way I wanted it to. Now, the ends were overlapping at the feed point, but this was by design. So I trim off this excess using my Dremel tool and a cutoff tool. I adjust this, I adjust that, I unbend this, I flatten this out, I clean that up, and now we get to prepare the antenna for testing. As before, we need to tin the ends at the feed point. Using solder paste, solder, and my soldering gun, I accomplished this. I created a similar device to secure the ends for testing using some PVC pipe, just the same way I did for the wire version. This is attached to the antenna with zip ties like I did before. I unsoldered the 4 to 1 ballon from the wire version and soldered it to this new tubing version of the antenna. Now we're ready to see how it performs. As you can see here, the performance is very similar to the wire version. The SWR is below 1.5 to 1 across the entire 2 meter band. But the 70 centimeter Band frequencies are three times those of the two meter band. So it raises the question as to the possible performance on the 70 centimeter band. The sweet spot of this antenna on the two meter band is around 147 megahertz. And this would put the potential sweet spot on the 70 centimeter band at around three times that or 441 megahertz. So let's just go see where it lay. Well, it's actually around 447 megahertz. The SWR doesn't drop below two to one until we hit around 434 megahertz. It drops down to 1.7 to one at around 441 megahertz. But this response fits the US repeater frequencies very nicely with inputs and outputs residing between 442 and 450 megahertz. This puts the sweet spot of this antenna right on top of the repeater rich portion of the band. Now to make a more substantial center support using a kitchen cutting board. I bought a run of the mill plastic kitchen cutting board to use here. I cut it just as you see here like a T I drilled some holes just big enough for some number 16 wire to go through it on either side of the tubing. I made little U-shaped pieces of the 16 gauge wire to fit over the tubing through the cutting board. I pulled it tightly in place. I bent it over on the other side. These wires ended up having to be about two inches long or five centimeters long to be able to make that trip around the tubing through the cutting board and still have room to bend them over on the back. I soldered the wire to the tubing on the top. I trimmed the wires to length and soldered them on the bottom to secure them in, all in place. I also drilled some holes so I could use a zip tie to secure the four to one ballon in place. If I intended to deploy this antenna somewhere, I probably would have designed this a bit differently. The one I have in my attic is suspended with a string tied to the loop of the antenna itself. I will leave it up to you to design a mounting system that works for you. If you come up with a good design, please share it with the rest of us. So how does this new modified antenna perform? As you can see here, it moved the sweet spot of the antenna down in frequency on the two meter band, which is a nice thing. We are still below 1.5 to 1 across the entire 2 meter band as before, but the sweet spot of the antenna now sits at about 146.7 megahertz. But how does it work on 70 centimeters? Well, unfortunately, its performance has suffered some. Its SWR is still below 2 to 1 at frequencies useful for repeaters, the difference here is that the best SWR is 1.85 to 1 at about 447 megahertz. Now, it will absolutely look differently at the end of a piece of feed line. I know the one that I have hanging in my attic does. One last important note. 
I mentioned that the motivation to build this antenna using tubing as opposed to the solid copper was weight. So I have to ask, how much did we actually reduce the weight of the antenna by building it with tubing? As compared to the solid copper wire version, the tubing version is 35% lighter. Yes, 35% lighter. And this includes the 4 to 1 ballon in both cases. Well, now you know how to build one of these awesome antennas for yourself. It's quite easy, and from the experience that I've had using mine, it works well, too. If you found this video helpful, please click on the like, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching. Until next time, toodaloots!